Hey, Rush, for coming, everyone. We'll get started in a few minutes. We're going to give people the chance to filter in. All right, it is about five after. I see we've got about 50 participants with us and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get started. I'm going to start with the land acknowledgement very briefly. We are gathered here today in, in Toronto, where we're being, the event is being hosted in Toronto at the University of Toronto on lands that have historically and to the present day have been shared in contestation and cooperation with, between the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee. So we have some Anishinaabek and some Haudenosaunee speakers with us here today. And I want to recall at this time the uh, the Dish with One Swoon Wampum, which was an agreement between Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee about coexistence and sharing resources and being together on this land. And then also I want to um, recall the the appropriation of these lands of Toronto um, on treaty under Treaty 13 by the Canadian settler government. And that's the this is the these are the treaty histories that bring us to the present day. So first of all, thank you all for coming. I'm going to ask Maria to, to open up uh, the, uh, to start us off by speaking a little bit about the Pro Seminar Speakers series. This, uh, this, co this conversation is being conducted in, um, in cooperation between the, art, the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto, the Art Museum at the University of Toronto, and the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape, and uh, Design Pro Seminar Speaker Series MBS. So Maria, could you introduce us to the speaker series? It's good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us on what is turning into a rainy day here in Toronto. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Decolonize This Place um, to Toronto, to our territories here in the city. Um, Mick and Sarah, thank you so much for partnering with the MBS post-seminar speaker series for this year. Um, this is the final session of the speaker series and we've really packed it in um, combined forces and it's such a pleasure that we're able to proceed and bring everyone together at this point in time. Um, Jason Lujan and I have been organizing the speaker series and based on the studio visits earlier today, you know, I think that was just, you know, I just felt like I'm so ready for the DTP um, class that you're going to be teaching soon, I hope, again. But anyway, welcome to everyone. We have a great lineup, and I look forward to the rest of the event today. Thank you. Miigwech. Miigwech, Maria. I'm going to ask Sarah uh, now to speak um, on the, uh, the contribution of the Art Museum and the Nations by Artists exhibition. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, Maria, thank you for having work in the exhibition as well. It's another uh, crossover. Um, so yeah, I'm Sarah. I'm co-curator with Mick of the exhibition Nations by Artists. Um, and of course, this is an online event. I want to remind people the show is still up in person. You can come and visit us up until Saturday. These are the final closing days. Um, and you know how this coalesced together, I think, is also um, speaks to a lot of the crossovers that we'll talk about today in the discussion. Um, many months ago, when Mick was kind of still new to the Department of Art History, 
um, they were talking to me about really wanting to bring Decolonize This Place into Toronto for a residency, which I, I loved that, um, that that could be a form of a scholars in residence. Um, and at the time I was already doing some of the broad strokes research toward Joe and it just automatically, I instantly on the moment said, you know, we should make these projects happen together. Um, so that's the story of how this exhibition built into what it is. And I really have to um, thank you sincerely Mick, for all your collaboration in this process. And um, the exhibition really um, grew way beyond the kind of broad strokes as a project that is much stronger um, now. And hopefully I'll signal there's been a lot of teaching out of this exhibition. Um, and my hope is that that means there are a lot of tentacles for all the conversations I the show to continue out onto the streets and not be limited to inside the museum. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the artists speaking today. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. I have um, a message here from uh, Gareth Long, who is going to be, who would like to say some words on behalf of MVS. Unfortunately, we don't have him on the speaker panel. We might have to have him follow up at the end, but I'll just, uh, I'll just read what, what he sent us here. He's like, yes, just wanted to welcome everyone on behalf of the Visual Studies Department and to thank Maria and Jason for the MB MBS Pro Seminar Series. So I'll have Gareth Long join us at the end in order to, uh, to, to speak his few words. Um, what I'd like to do now is I'm going to introduce the, the, the topic that we're speaking to you today, and I'm going to introduce the speakers. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started. All right. Hopefully everyone is able to see um, the presentation well. All right. The title today comes from this banner that was created by Decolonize this place for a, for a direct action. It's titled Under the Museum, Under the University, Under the City, The Land. This is an artist roundtable, which we're bringing together a number of artists who are engaged in um, decolonial struggles in different forms of intervention in the museum, in the university, in the city, from direct action to building collective memory to, um, to grassroots kind of interventions in the landscape. Um, I would like us to start of, to take this, this banner, this image, and this concept of under the museum, under the university, under the city, the land. And I'd like us to kind of think together about some how the, the history of these interventions, all right, from a decolonial perspective, both locally and then across struggles. And I'd like us to take this as kind of both a provocation and an expression of kind of other possibilities. Um, so I'm gonna start us off by, by um, mentioning where this, this title, this banner comes from. It's a reference to this history of uh, in the 1968 Paris uprisings, the student uprisings. At that time, the situationists and well, and the movement in general, there is a saying there, sous les pavés, la plage, under the cobblestones, the beach. This was a calling attention. This is one of the slogans that called attention to this, this intervention in an architecture of a city that had been redesigned in order to suppress um, the potential for more rev for revolutionary moments, right? So in the architecture, these wide boulevards, um, these cobblestones, all this kind of inter this architecture that the that the um, the students were finding themselves within, how to intervene on that? One of the concepts was under the pay the cobblestones themselves, the stuff that the literally the ground of the city, that these are objects too, right? The cobblestones are ground that you can pick up, and beneath that is the beach. The beach, as uh, I was talking with Sarah earlier. Sibmil as is signifies a number of things for them at the time it was uh, it was about leisure it was about the refusal to to work to labor to have their labor alienated from them right so I think we can depart from this a bit because the provocation is from the cobblestones under the cobblestones the beach but now we're thinking about institutionally we're thinking about the museum we're thinking about the city we're thinking about um, the institution how to tick up those cobblestones. What does it look like to pick up those cobblestones? And then what do we do with them? What potentials do those have? In 1968, of course, I mean, we know from that um, Guy Debord in the, the Society of the Spectacle, he talks about how this, uh, these became building blocks for other realities, right? One of the things you can do with a paving stone you pick up from the ground is you can throw it at a cop, right? 
It's about resistance. You can also build things like a barricade across these broad boulevards. You can take up the pieces of the city itself and use it for other things. So I, was, uh, I would like to invite the, uh, this, our speakers today to reflect on these histories and reflect especially on the maybe parallel at the uh, histories that were happening here at the same time, because our, the histories of our resistance movements are deep. Sometimes I feel that it's difficult to keep up the institutional memory of those movements. And I find that art, artists, art spaces has been a place where this work is being done in a really strong way. So I'm gonna introduce these, these, uh, these artists and one art collective in order to speak to some of the work they've been doing and some of the work they see as being fruitful in this regard. How do we pick up those paving stones? And then how do we build something else with them? So first of all, I'm gonna introduce uh, I'll introduce them in order of uh, that they'll be speaking uh, today. I'm going to first introduce Susan Blythe. So Susan is Anishinaabe of Kuchiching First Nation, and she's an interdisciplinary artist working with public uh, public art, site-specific intervention, photography, film, and social practice. So her solo and collaborative work engages questions of personal and cultural identity and its relationship to space. As part of the Ogma Mikana project, she worked to restore Anishinaabe when place names to the streets, avenues, roads, paths, and trails of Gitche, Kiwenging, Toronto, right? Uh, for the Tree Protection Zone project on Hardhouse Commons, which Maria and I co-curated last year, and it's still up, to, uh, still up this year, Susan Blight made one of the construction hoardings into an experiment in public space intervention using biodegradable stickers and the Anishinaabe Mwen language. So uh, Blight is also the Delaney Chair in Indigenous Visual Cultures at OCAD U, and an assistant professor in the Faculty of Arts and Science. All right. Following uh, Susan's talk, I will, we will be hearing from Alan Michelson. Um, Alan Michelson is an internationally recognized New York-based artist, curator, writer, lecturer, and a Mohawk member of the Six Nations of the Grand River. His socially engaged, engaged site-specific art practice is grounded in local context and informed by the retrieval of repressed histories. Sourcing from both indigenous and Western culture, he works across painting, sculpture, photography, sound, video, glass, stone, lots of things. His work, Blanket Refusal in Nations by Artists, um, brings the spirit of the original treaties back into the frame of Haudenosaunee settler relations and demonstrates the continuities between wampum and the written word. Um, after Alan, we'll be hearing from uh, Jolene Rickard of the Tuscarora Nation. Jolene Rickard is an artist, a curator, and an associate professor of the History of Art and Visual Studies and director of American Indian Indigenous Studies program at Cornell University. She is a recipient of a Ford Foundation research grant and is currently conducting research in the Americas, Europe, New Zealand, and Australia toward a new journal on Indigenous aesthetics. She has a forthcoming book on visualizing sovereignty. As well, her family history, as well as her scholarship in art, is deeply tied to a legacy of um, of Haudenosaunee traditional governance and a long-standing and ongoing practice of anti-colonial resistance. Um, following Jolene, we will hear at last from MTL Plus, the collective who are the facilitators for the larger collective, larger movement that is Decolonize This Place. Decolonize This Place is an action-oriented collective based in New York City that uses cultural institutions as platforms to amplify the demands of decolonial social movements. So facilitated by MTL Plus, uh, the DTP consists of over 30 collaborators, grassroots groups, and art collectives that seek to resist, unsettle, and reclaim the city. So their contribution to the Nations by Artists exhibition is an in-gallery movement space uh, with materials for study and action. For this conversation, we welcome um, five, four, four <laughs> of, the, of the MTL Plus facilitators. We have Amin Hussein, Natasha Dillon, Amy Wang, Mar Safor, and um, we regret to not be able to speak with Crystal Hans today, but she is with us still. Um, Decolonize This Place joins the roundtable as guests of the Art History Department, University of Toronto here. So we're pleased to have you. So I'm going to go ahead and ask Susan to start us off. Um, Susan, I'm going to, I'll, I'll show some of these slides. Let me know when you would like to need to change them or if you would like me to turn them off. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mick. Um, yeah, uh, Ani, bonjour, Mick and Aknan Dodem. Nanani Gune Bik Nindigo, Susan Blight and Indigena Kaz, Shagana Shiwana Kazoyan, Kuchiching and Don Chipa, Minoa Toronto, Nindishita Nongom. So, hi, my English name is Susan Blight. I'm Snapping Turtle Clan, Anishinaabe uh, from Kuchiching First Nation in Treaty Number no. Three. Um, Kuchiching is where I'm a member at, that's where my mom is a member at, and my maternal grandfather. 
Uh, my maternal grandmother comes from Nakachewenan, also in Treaty 3. And my uh, father's mother comes from Mishko Zibing in Treaty 3, which in English is known as Big Grassy First Nation. So um, yeah, I've lived in Toronto now for about 10 years. And might I propose that I'm really honored to be on this panel with these folks. Um, I've admired all of your work for a really long time and this feels, um, this feels like a pretty special day. So thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I would like to really um, dig into this provocation that was offered by Mick. I think there's something here that is resonant with the work that I've been doing for the past 10 years and, and um, a lot to sort of grapple with. I think Mick, do you have a um, maybe an image of the hoarding? I think I'll start there. Thank you. So this work, as Mick mentioned, is um, included in the Tree Protection Zone, the TPZ project in front of Hart House. Um, I worked at the U of T for 10 years and thought a lot about the land that is underneath the campus. I thought a lot about the um, uh, non-human beings who call this place home now and did in the past, as well as the human beings who um, are the indigenous peoples of this place. And as a citizen of the Anishinaabe Nation of Treaty Number no. Three, I do consider myself a guest on this territory and have spent the last almost 12 years trying to understand what it means to be in good relation here and to contribute something um, to this place. So this work is called Six Kilometers and 8,000 Years Long. Um, it is really uh, meant to recollect and have us make meaning out of our relationship to Toronto's sort of forgotten rivers. I once heard Candace Hopkins say we were at a gathering um, where with myself, with Lisa Myers, Bonnie Devine, Ange Loft, um, Darlene Manning and Candace, a, a gathering where we were really thinking through water, the, and specifically the waterways of Toronto. And at that gathering, I heard Candace say that Toronto is a city that has turned its back on its waters. And it took me a minute to, um, like I had a visceral reaction to that, you know, and it made me want to understand what it might mean to reorient ourselves back to the water, um, both collectively and on, and on an individual basis. What does it mean to reorient ourselves back towards our true governing bodies? And so this work is very much about that. Um, I want to acknowledge that there has been a lot of work done to sort of uncover the histories of Toronto's waterways, it's forgotten waterways, it's polluted waterways, and it's otherwise harmed waterways. And specifically in this work, I'm thinking through Tattle Creek, you know, this, um, this waterway that was extremely important, that was um, at one time healthy and ran through this, you know, ran through the land that the campus of the University of Toronto that it not occupies, uh, which is now buried underneath settlement, buried underneath concrete and used now as a subterranean sewer for the city. And because of that sort of identity, you know, that, that Tattle Creek holds in many ways for us, it remains as citizens you know, of this place or inhabitants, I guess, of this place, um, it, it occupies a kind of unknowable place for us. The majority of us can't come into contact with Tattle Creek. We can't touch it. I mean, there are very few places in Toronto where we can touch the water, right? Um, but Tattle Creek is very much um, withheld from us. Yet we sense its presence, you know? Um, as you walk along Philosopher's Walk from the ROM to say Hart House where this work is, we feel its presence. And there are moments where Toronto's waterways rise up in resistance, right? Um, anyone who knows the U of T campus knows that King's College Circle floods every year in the spring, right? Disrupting um, convocation, disrupting, um, um, I think disruptive to the U of T's sort of bureaucratic nature as well in a lot of ways, right? 
But that to me speaks to a kind of resistance and to an agency that the water has to uh, go beyond the confines that um, the settler state has placed upon it. And so the title itself, Six Kilometers and 8,000 Years Long, is really a reference to the length and the um, historical resonance of Tattle Creek, um, this, this river that still runs underneath much of Toronto, traveling down from like St. Clair Avenue to south of the U of T campus. And um, the phrase here is an Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Mawin phrase that is really meant to have us reflect on both our responsibilities and our and commitments to the waterways, but also our own ambivalence. So in English, this phrase um, translates to, we haven't forgotten the river entirely. And to me, this is about, this, this phrase has both a question and an ambivalence and a commitment within it. Meaning, what does it mean to not forget the waterways? What does it mean to not forget the river? And the ambivalence is in the entirely, right? Because in, for many of us, we have forgotten. If we can't see it, we'll forget it often. And so I like this phrase because I think what it does is allow us to reflect on um, our own abilities to think beyond the temporal, to think beyond what is um, currently possible, I guess. And that's important to me because that is about a kind of um, turning away from the legitimacy of the state. You know, the settler colonial state of Canada needs us to buy into its stability or its perceived stability, its permanence. Um, it sort of pushes us towards believing that the state itself is stable and cannot be changed and is here forever. Where, you know, whereas if we look historically and we look at our futurities, both of those things, we can see that, um, empires do fall, you know, and that there are cracks in the, in, there are cracks in those walls that the states, that the state puts up. So for me, these are kind of um, both material and metaphorical, right? These types of offerings um, and material in the sense that I'm trying to contribute something that does not contribute to the harming of the waterways and the land itself and metaphorical in the sense that it's an offering that is meant to make us reflect on our commitments and our responsibilities, our futurities and our locations. So this work is sort of important as an opening. I was, you know, I asked Mick to show it first because I think that it is a good entryway into some themes that are present throughout the entirety of my work. Um, I think my work overall is really about offering avenues for thinking about land in a different way than what we've, what we're currently offered. Um, to think about land as not merely a surface upon which events or histories or stories even happen, but as a space of possibility, um, as the land having agency and being non-static, you know, maybe it doesn't change at the same scale as our eyes perceive, but the land is always changing, moving, shifting, forming itself, making its own decisions. The land, you know, runs on its own time, um, which is often illegible to us, but is there. So I think my, my work is always sort of pushing towards a sort of practice of uprooting or trying to uproot normative modes of thinking about space. And I say space as opposed to land but I think they're interchangeable if we think about land as expansive, right? If we think about an Anishinaabe understandings of land being constituted of not just the surface of what we see, but underneath, you know, the water underneath, the soil underneath, and then up into the sky world. And that includes the spirit world as well. So I think those two things can be interchangeable if we think about land more expansively than what Western um, modes of thought have offered us about land. And in that work, I'm really sort of um, thinking alongside, if I can propose that I can think alongside somebody as brilliant as Mishawana Goman, um, as well as feminist geographers like Doreen Massey, you know, people who are 
really redefining, I guess not redefining, offering us, op like offering us doorways into thinking about space as products of interrelations, um, as spheres of possibility. That's a really important idea to me because it, for me, it moves us away from essentialist notions of what constitutes land as well and opens up the avenues for imagination and creativity as also theories of change as it pertains to land, uh, to climate catastrophe, to settler colonialism and the breaking down and the, um, I guess, um, the dismantling of the settler colonial state. So yeah, the TPZ project, 17 panels, compostable stickers. I, I'm very interested and invested in collaboration and collectivity. So a lot of my work is done collectively. Even this work, um, I invited uh, folks who are working with the TPZ project, as well as friends of mine to come and help me put up um, what, what ended up being, I think, 2,400 and something stickers um, as a process of trying to undo some of the Western notions of authorship as it pertains to art making. Um, that is a really important ethos for me in my practice, because I think it pushes back against um, the idea of, I'm making air quotes if you can't see me, the artist as creator, the artist as auteur, or um, I think it also pushes back against notions of authorship and ownership. And that's important to me as an Anishinaabe person because this language is collectively owned and the knowledge that is contained within this language is collectively owned. Um, it's not mine to, <laughs> to, it's not mine to own, I guess is what I'm saying. And so in that way, this, this installation is both, I mean, it's both installation and social practice because part of what is imbued in the work is that collectivity, that um, notion of um, working together um, as a means of, I guess, undoing some of the harms that come with um, with ideas of ownership and authorship. And my hope is that this sort of collective practice, this collective action of stickering um, allows us all to sort of reflect on these questions that are being asked, but at the same time references um, what is another really important part of my life, which is my activism. So Nick, Mick, you could move to the, the photo of the Ogima Mikanar installation. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure how many people in the room are familiar with the work that I've done with Ogima Mikana. I'm just going to give a very broad overview of what we've done. Um, so this is a collective that uh, was formed in 2013, uh, myself and Hayden King, who is an Anishinaabe scholar from Chimna Singh, co-founded the collective in 2013. And, um, uh, in 2013, we started just to do this very simple action of just putting up these street signs. We would make a version that looked at least somewhat like this official city version with our own Anishinaabe um, translations on top, over top of the official one. Um, so this is really a, pro a project rooted in intervention and site specificity. At the time, we were doing these um, actions in solidarity with the Idle No More movement. And that's an important part historically, simply because, or in terms of like the origin story of our collective, that's important because Hayden and I were both quite involved in this, um, what was at that time a very visible indigenous rights movement um, that was interesting to me because of the way it utilized public space um, for indigenous resistance, you know? Um, at that time, there were round dances in malls and all kinds of things that were, it was amazing to see other, you know, sort of commercial or legitimized space used for, um, used for reasons beyond commercialis commercialism, you know, used for resistance and assertion of indigenous rights and presence. And also just to see indigenous peoples um, claiming space in a way that was very powerful, you know, as people who've been systematically kept out of spaces, you know, as people who have been legislated to, you know, specifically legislated upon to, to um, limit our movements on the land. This to me was a very important aspect of Idle No More. 
And so um, when Hayden and I began talking about some things that we might do, we came up with this idea of the street signs. It was really based in uh, a genuine desire to contribute to an indigenous, uh, you know, a global now, <laughs> but at that time, national indigenous rights movement, but also to um, offer, if we could anything, to offer the idea that our language, Anishinaabe Mawin, was also an important aspect of this, these things that we were fighting for. Because contained within that language is incredibly deep philosophical Anishinaabe knowledge that we should have known. You know, um, I'm actively working as a middle-aged woman <laughs> towards learning my language and learning the things that should have been mine to know in the first place. So that also was something that we wanted to, we wanted people to think about. The other important aspect of this is that this is taking place in urban areas. You know, um, at this point in my life, I've lived in cities. I grew up in on a small reserve in Northwestern Ontario and in small rural towns in Northwestern Ontario. I didn't live in a city until I was 18 and moved away to university. But at this point in my life, I've lived more than half my life in a city. And so this idea of reclaiming urban space is also important. I mean, I think it's changing now. I think it's changed a lot actually, specifically in the city of Toronto, there's a lot more indigenous presence in, in the public sphere. But at that time there really was, there was very, very little. And in fact, at that time, and I think still to this day, you know, indigenous peoples are often um, positioned within the colonial imaginary as somehow incommensurate with cities. Like we are somehow out of place in cities, which is um, a fallacy, you know, um, we have contributed to cities throughout the, the history, you know, throughout history, we have contributed to cities and before colonization, we had our own cities and, you know, the, it's something that we all that we've always tried to sort of push back against. And so um, that was also a very important aspect, as well as just sort of reflecting back to Anishinaabe people, our own language, which now seems very simple, but in fact, at that time, it was very rare to see. I'm just conscious of time. So the last thing I just wanted to sort of talk about with regards to this work is its connection to mapping. And I think this is going to lead, you know, um, this is sort of, I think, touching upon and thinking alongside mixed provocation about, about the land under the, you know, uh, under the museum, under the institution, under the city, under the university, the land. Um, and so in many ways, this work of putting up street signs, there's the object itself, there's the sign that's, you know, that, but there's the action, the, the intervention itself. And that intervention can't take place without Hayden and I utilizing our bodies to walk through the city and to do it in this sort of uh, fugitive way. We would often go very early in the morning with a ladder and put it up and um, have been threatened with being charged with vandalism, with trespassing um, and those types of things. So there's that fugitive sense of movement as well of not sort of waiting for permission to do things either, to not go through official channels with the city in order to do this, but just to actually assert our right to claim back, to, to reclaim land that is ours for our, our language and our philosophies and our ways of knowing and being. And so I think about that, that sort of walking and Mick mentioned guide to board, you know, I think this is following alongside that a bit too. Um, but in a very specifically <laughs> Anishinaabe way, I think about that walking as a kind of mapping. You know, if we think about mapping as a way of making the land coherent, um, a way of coming to know land, I think our walking in, in putting up these signs is also a kind of, of mapping. And like, if we think about sort of standard colonial maps and their, the ways in which they articulate land, um, those types of maps don't come anywhere near the kind of complexity and fluidity of Anishinaabe understandings of what constitutes land or what rather what land is constituted of. Um, nor do they sort of begin to communicate how I as an Anishinaabe woman come to, come to be in relationship to land and come to understand land. 
The other thing is that those types of maps really hold these connotations of um, imperialism, of imperial notions of um, property, of ownership, of, um, you know, the city is a kind of Euclidean geometry of grids and, think, and, and thinking of land as something that can be cut up and bought and sold. So this work is really about challenging those kind of colonial representations of land. Because ultimately as an Anishinaabe person, um, my practice has to be embodied. You know, um, I have to approach these intellectual understandings or philosophical understandings in a holistic way. I have to sort of understand it, understand it through the body at the same time as understanding it intellectually or philosophically. And so this sort of mapping, if we consider this walking and putting up signs as a kind of mapping, this sort of mapping is also, I think, a kind of Anishinaabe writing. And it, in fact, it brings Anishinaabe writing back to an embodied practice that can both sort of name and resist the epistemic rupture that has occurred with colonization, the separation or the severing of us as Anishinaabe people from the knowledges that are rightfully ours. And so the last thing I'll say is that these, um, these sort of actions for me are about speaking back to that colonial violence that is contained and communicated through mapping, that kind of domination and conquest that has occurred and is articulated through mapping, but also to assert and put forward and validate our own um, representations of our movements, our uh, languages, our philosophies, and to make something that is ultimately um, done in a spirit of rebelliousness and resistance of not giving a shit what the city has to say about it or who takes it down or who wants to um, threaten us and um, ultimately remaining uncontainable and uncapturable to the colonial gaze. So I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Miigwech, Susan. That's, you've given us so much to think with there. I'm especially interested in how you talk about um, just being and walking in the city and using that as a kind of intervention, right? A remapping of this entire space, which I think fits well with our situationist uh, <clears throat> um, premise here. I'd like to ask Alan Michelson to come in and speak with us next. We're going to switch modes a little bit and speak more to the depth of memory and to some archival work that Alan did and is uh, bringing that memory into a gallery space. So Alan, please. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I wanted to actually preface, I'm going to discuss this work that's, uh, that's in the show, um, a recent work uh, that uh, activates the archive in a way to uh, to talk about sovereignty and its uh, and its its uh, its problems with um, you know with the settler state. Um, I just want to uh, preface it with uh, uh, you know, and I don't mean this as a pun, but a watershed work for me was a 1989-1990 site-specific outdoor sculptural installation I did for the Public Art Fund commemorating the Collect, which was a deep freshwater lake that once occupied some 48 acres of land in what's now Lower Manhattan, just north of Foley Square. It was an ancient Lenape place evidenced by the huge shell middens on its banks. And after colonization, it was the main water supply of the city. In the 18th century, a tannery established itself on its banks and other polluting industries followed, slaughterhouses and distilleries, utterly poisoning the pond. The solution after poisoning it was to bury it, which they did by leveling the surrounding hills and middens and building sort of as its headstone, uh, the way I think of it, the first notorious prison and execution ground in New York City known as the tombs, still known as the tombs to this day, the, the present uh, incarnation of it. And that, that sequence of pond to prison to me is very instructive. But I'd like to get to, um, and that actually opened up a, a, a way of, of working that um, you know I've been doing since then, um, and I've also <clears throat> done many uh, many pieces on the waterways not only of New York but also waterways used as boundaries like at Six Nations or at um, at, at the at the Canadian border at, at the St Lawrence uh, where I have another uh, public artwork. 
But I want to talk about this, this other piece. Um, in January of 1924, U.S. Representative Homer Snyder of New York introduced uh, uh, the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924. And uh, this was an act that the Haudenosaunee opposed right from the start. This was an act that the Haudenosaunee opposed from the start. Um, the original language uh, granted citizenship to a native um, people born within the United States or what they were considering in the United States um, who requested it. But it was changed uh, in committee to a blanket um, conferral of, of citizenship uh, onto people who were already citizens of their own nations. So the Onondaga chiefs um, opposing this wrote a letter to Calvin Coolidge, to the president at the time. Uh, and I'll read the letter. It says, therefore, our brother, be it resolved that inasmuch as the Snyder Bill is a destructive and an injurious weapon in nature and aspect to the Indians at large, individually and collectively, we Indians, as a party to the treaty between the United States and the Six Nations, do hereby protest the Snyder Bill inasmuch as it abrogates sections one, two, four of the treaty. And the treaty that he's referring to, or they're referring to, sorry, is, um, is the Treaty of Canandaigua in 1794. But there were earlier treaties with the United States, between the United States and the Haudenosaunee um, before that. Therefore, be it resolved that we, the Indians of the Onondaga tribe of the Six Nations, duly depose and sternly protest the principle and object of the aforesaid Snyder Bill. We, the Indians, have not yet, as yet, tired of the free use and enjoyment of our rights as Indians living on reservations for the reasons of safeguarding the Indians as a whole against unscrupulous advances of any element to the detriment of our welfare, present and future. We again and further protest the principle and aim of the Snyder Bill. Wherefore, we, the undersigned counseling chiefs of this Onondaga nation, recommend the abandonment and repeal of the Snyder Bill. So what I did is I just reproduced this, this two-page letter, a uh, typewritten letter at the time, which you can see all of the governmental stamps that uh, accumulated on it uh, as it, as it uh, made the rounds, um, onto two blankets. Uh, it's you know, sort of a pun of uh, a blanket refusal to a blanket act that was made without consultation, without approval of the people involved and, um, and produced it uh, in a way that would uh, also uh, bring in our, our way of, uh, of uh, dealing with documents, which is um, through wampum and, and going back to the original, um, you know, the first real treaty between our people and, um, and the, uh, the you know, the settlers, which was the, uh, the two row wampum, which is, you know, known for the two purple rows set against a, a white uh, background. Um, now, the Onondaga Council of Chiefs um, uh, didn't rest uh, with this letter. And the next year, uh, one of the chiefs, uh, Jesse Lyons, actually went to Washington with some of our belts um, to try to uh, deliver the message that you know, you need to you need to be reminded that you have treaties with us, that we are sovereign nations, um, and uh, and not uh, U.S. citizens. Um, you know, how can you have a treaty with yourself? You know, it, it's sort of like that. So obviously, they were thinking about some sort of dual citizenship, um, which you know, in a way, has been imposed. Um, but uh, but we. Uh, who never, you know, who never um, lost militarily to the United States, um, we still think of ourselves as, as sovereign, uh, the sovereign uh, confederacy, uh, six nations. So that's, that's really the work uh, in a nutshell. Uh, you know, what, what is not present in that piece or in that letter is the resistance that, that actually happened from, from day one, you know, the, the resistance that was military. Um, you know, I made a, a recent piece that uh, was about the invasion of our lands, the, the massive invasion of our lands by an army of, of close to 5,000, probably the biggest campaign of the American Revolution, the Revolutionary War, ordered by George Washington to um, summarily to, to just burn us out of our, of our homelands. Uh, and, and, and it did. Um, 
I mean, uh, we, we came back to a point, but um, that, was a, that was something called the Sullivan Expedition in 1779, and it, uh, it, it, it destroyed, and Washington was, you know, his title among, among us and among other Native people was Town Destroyer, Hannah de Gaius, um, a title he inherited from his, um, his great-grandfather, who was also a Virginia militia colonel who, who um, who ordered the uh, the murder of, of five um, of Virginia natives or natives from that area uh, who were um, who were coming to parley? So Washington earned this for himself with this with this terrible um, invasion. Uh, and uh, and so there's been constant pressure to surrender our lands. Uh, you know, after the American Revolution, and um, we were sold out by the. The British at the uh, Treaty of Paris, and, and there was this massive conferral of, of non-ceded land to to the to the United States. Um, you know, we resisted best we could, but there was you know incredible pressure uh, from uh, you know squatters and settlers, and um, and also the United States because um, its coffers were empty, and some of the early budgets of uh, of the United States government, the early government, were actually based on, on uh, taking land from us and, and, uh, and using that land to pay soldiers off and, and other things. Um, so uh, we're deeply involved. We were the first, maybe, um, in a way, in that westward expansion. Uh, and there was a formula that was, that was uh, applied here that was applied uh, all the way to California, which was, um, you know, uh, uh, squatters coming in on our lands um, starting trouble, um, violence ensuing, um, the squatters calling for the government to to punish uh, the native, the resisting native um, nation, uh, and then a massive army uh, sent, uh, usually uh, a total war sort of uh, ar you know army that would not only burn towns but you know uh, take hostages and. Um, uh, you know, all sorts of tactics that, um, that we now call sort of total war or genocidal sort of tactics. And that was applied pretty much all the way through. Then the army would be called in. Then there would be a treaty uh, that would, um, you know, promise peace, but that would uh, take a, a lot of land at the same time. And it just went that way all the way across the, the country. So, um, you know, this represents not only... Um, something in that tradition, but it's, it's, it's clearly about uh, the attempt to sort of what they were thinking is civilizing us <laughs> um, through uh, a for, you know, many, uh, many measures of forced assimilation, um, the whole boarding school thing, the whole missionization, you know, religious um, missionaries sent to reserves, um, and, uh, and, and other tactics uh, such as this. This was going to be the culminating one you know, the, um, the allotments of, uh, of reserves of, uh, you know, trying to turn us into, um, you know, individual owners of land, uh, we who had, you know, held land in common and, and so forth. So this has been, um, this has been, you know, hundreds of years of this sort of thing. And I just thought that, um, you know, I wasn't aware of this letter uh, until fairly recently. And, you know, my whole project is really one of self-education because I'm curious about how things got so screwed up. And, um, and when I find out, I usually, it moves me to make a work. And then if the work has any legs, um, then that gets disseminated, that, that information or that. Um, again, it's usually not something that's, um, that's shown in the history books. So, um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Yeah, I, I'm wondering too, because this is a kind of an intervention in the in an archival way, right? This is a remembering of something that I think that on the side of the government, kind of they tried to file away in bureaucratic ways and let it kind of become part of history. So how I was wondering if you could speak to how do you see this work as being part of the kind of the continual re-speaking of this? How does this help? become part of our public memory, you know, this resistance history? Well, you know, it's, first of all, it's an act of surfacing, you know. 
um, you know, things like the pond. You know, I was thinking how, how sort of primitive it is to think that by throwing something, <laughs> throwing an object in a body of water, that you've made it disappear. <laughs> you know, no, you've, you've only made it wet. You know, that's all you've done. And it's, and it's still there, and it's doing its, its work, you know, on the body of water. Um, and, and actually, the springs that once fed that enormous lake, that deep 48-acre lake, um, are being used to cool the criminal courts building's air conditioning system. So, you know, there's, there's some uh, repurposing, <laughs> you know. But, um, yeah, I, I, I think the archive can be used... Um, to tell a different story, especially stuff that really is somewhat obscure and, uh, and can be brought to light, can surface, um, and then maybe surprise people with things that they hadn't been aware of, like, um, like that there was a big pond there at one time that was you know, there for 15,000 years, but it didn't survive, it didn't survive 200 years of, of, of colonization. You know? so, you know, all the violence is not only violence against the people, it's violence against everything. It's a violence against uh, Turtle Island, uh, you know, in all of its, 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 uh, all of its form, um, you know, against the, uh, the land and the waters and everything on it or, or swimming in it or in the air. Um, and, and, you know, as they buried this pond, you know, the vegetation um, rotted so that the landfill stunk <laughs> yeah. and they and the idea was that they created this little land they were going to call it paradise square <laughs> and have it be this you know rich enclave but it stunk so bad that they um that they turned it into a prison and then it be, also was the area that became the notorious five points you know that, that crime-ridden area of, of new york um, a slum so, you know, you look at that trajectory and you go, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's civilization. There you go. That's progress. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sure, you know, we all love New York as it is, but, you know, it's funny to sort of kill a pond downtown and then build another one, mm -hmm. you know, midtown, <laughs> you know. Build like a different the, one, yeah. That constructed yeah, pond in the middle of New York, of course. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's um, you know, it's a sense of, of domination, that is so strong, you know, um, and, and if you think about it, they, you know, uh, they really weren't respecting us. They did everything they could in, in various stages to, um, uh, you know, to diminish our sovereignty, you know, and there were, there were things just made up out of the whole cloth, like, the, you know, the, the Christian doctrine of discover, discovery, which basically just, you know, neutralizes, <laughs> you know, us as anything except these sort of wandering occupants, you know, um, and, and confers, a, a, you know, um, exclusive title <laughs> onto these European nations who, who claim the land, uh, it, you know, the absurd thing that somehow the land, um, you know, that they somehow deserve the land uh, more than we do, or that they're more entitled to the land that we do than we are. And there were those, you know, Supreme Court rulings, um, you know, during the whole time of the Cherokee um, removal, and the Cherokees were hiring lawyers. The Cherokees were quite sophisticated and were hiring lawyers. And um, and you know, a Supreme Court justice just made up this idea of domestic dependent nation. That no, we're de domestic dependent nations, just like there. You know, in in 2005, when um, the Oneida were, you know, buying back uh, some of their original land and wanted to then have its sovereignty, you know, re restored over that land. No, the state went, no, 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 you know, you're going to have to pay taxes and everyone, you know, so you can't go backwards. And, you know, I think it was um, the Supreme Court and, you know, under, I think Ruth Ginsburg actually wrote the, the, uh, the, the opinion saying that, no, it's too late, basically, you know, they, they use this term lashes uh, in a way that was never used before. So, um, so it, it basically, uh, you know, for a country that's that's claiming things like you know might doesn't make right you know in the in the in the uh, face of of Putin's uh, invasion of the Ukraine, you know <laughs> it, it's got a it's got a I think you know one of my projects is to get is to get it to look at its own history and to try to um, makes make whatever it can right you know and maybe mm -hmm. starting with the treaties and trying to honor those.
Mm -hmm. Bring us back to the treaties and those tr treaty relations. I wonder if I could pull on the thread that you brought up of that, that pond of the prison in those waterways, because I think there's a good connection with Susan's work here. I know you have to head out soon, but um, if we could bring us around to speak briefly about this, the piece that is about the waterways. I'm interested in how that waterway, that pond that was built over top continues to have a kind of an exert its presence, even if just in the smell and the kind of the nature of the land around it. And then how Susan talks about Tidal Creek, which runs directly under University of Toronto campus. It is still, even though it's a buried creek, it is still a creek. It fills with water every spring and a lot of us get muddy feet. It's still a presence, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, I mean, they did a pretty good job eradicating the collect. You know, it's, it's hard to, to get any sense of it. And the, and the topography was completely different. I mean, there was a massive, there was a hundred foot hill that was, that was just a regular hill. It wasn't even the shell middens that were there. So, you know, this idea of, I don't know if it's because it was a Dutch colony and they knew how to, you know, they like to fill in water, you know, um, and make land. But, uh, you know, it's, it's all of a piece. Um, but this, this piece is really about um, the St. Lawrence and the, the two branches of it as, it as it breaks around a Cornwall Island, which is, you know, Aquasasne territory. Um, and, you know, the bridge that connects Cornwall, Ontario to the... Uh, uh, New York State uh, mainland and, and the, you know, the international, um, you know, the border stations that were there. So this is actually in a, an United States border station in Messina. Um, and what I did is I, I got out in the, the St. Lawrence and I, I sailed around Cornwall Island um, and shot all, you know, four, three miles of, of, of four different shorelines that Basically, are the crossing, and then, um, and and then, uh, you know, use the two-row wampum as the format, and so it's it's a big glass piece. It's about forty feet long by almost six feet high, and um, it documents really the crossing from from the bottom, which is the Ontario mainland, and then it, it's mirrored to the um, you know the the northern shore of. Uh, of Cornwall Island and then Southern Shore and then finally New York State and um, you know there's there's factories and all sorts of polluting industries <laughs> that are you know also uh, depicted there but you know waterways were really um, things that brought us together you know uh, it, it, there weren't r really roads you know <laughs> uh, 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 or you know vehicles like we have now in the old days it was you know the water was the way to get around and I've, I've done several pieces where I've gotten out on, on a boat um, in urban situations and, um, you know, and looked at waterways or, or shot from waterways. In fact, there's one, I'm, I'm in the show now, Greater New York at PS1, and I, 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 uh, I shot some, um, you know, some panoramic footage um, from a boat of areas that were once known for their oyster grounds and projected them onto like three tons of oyster shells that are in a, in a long um, panoramic sort of arrangement. So I've been, I've been working with this material for a long time and I sort of moved between working with like the land, you know, as land um, in a way, uh, as boundary, as, as you know, political, um, um, geographic, you know, spiritual, it's all sort of crosses their uh, entity and then um, uh, things that are, are more sort of from the archive. Um, and, and sort of go back and forth uh, in that way. That's fabulous. And it brings us to, to an interesting space that we didn't include in this, in this uh, when we were addressing the museum, the university, the city, and under that, the land. An extension of that is the border, right? Under the border, the land, the water in this case. And I love this, uh, this, this formulation here, this piece here that uh, recalls the two row. Because I believe that this site, that land, that, I mean, that bridge crossing, between Cornwall in Canada and the United States is a site of regular Haudenosaunee intervention in the form of a walk across the bridge, right? Yes, they've closed the bridge from time to time. And, you know, Jolene can speak to her grandfather's, you know, whole uh, thing uh, with that. Not here, but at Peace Bridge in, in Buffalo. Oh, okay. Um, I believe. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, again, uh, uh, waterways uh, facilitated um, mm -hmm. relation in, in, in our uh, culture. And they became used really as fences and, and boundaries uh, in, in, in the settler culture. Um, and, uh, and so this piece is, you know, sort of 
got those things going. Wonderful. I've, you've given us two interesting thoughts from pond to prison and from river to fence. Yeah. Um, yeah, this whole notion of like looking under, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, um, you know, thinking about universities, um, you know, you can't even necessarily look under and, and see where that university endowment came from because it, you know, you're probably aware of the land grant stuff. Maybe Jolene will talk about that with, with, in terms of Cornell. That, you know, in order to fund uh, American, and, and probably, hap- I think it happened in Canada as well, is that, um, you know, universities um, were given uh, public land in the West that had been, you know, wrested from Native people for, you know, either, you know, token amounts for treaties or unratified treaties where there was nothing, no, nothing paid or just seized, you know, land seized outright. And they were able to then um, capitalize that land to pay for universities. So, you know, the Massachusetts, you know, MIT is one and, um, and, uh, and Cornell is one and there are many. And so if you think about universities as someplace that, you know, is somehow f- free of that, it's, it's, it's implicated as well, you know. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing. I'm going to um, I'm going to shift gears. I'm going to ask Jolene because we see who she has joined us to speak to to speak next. And thank you, Alan, for sharing there. Oh sure, I'm going to try to stay on a bit. I'll be late for my thing. All right, here, Jolene. Yeah. All right, Jolene, if you're um, able to unmute and speak with us here. Yeah. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. I thought I was pausing my share. Okay. Hi. Julian, I have a couple images if you would like to speak to them, but I'm also happy to uh, pause the screen share. Um, one of them is your corn blue room of 1998. And one of them is this image of the, of the, that cross, that border crossing demonstration. Mm-hmm. Um, by Haudenosaunee people, but I'll, I'll leave it to you to take us through. Um, hi, well, Nyawa and Twats Ganahat to everyone, Sego. Uh, thanks for welcoming he- me here this afternoon and always good to hear Alan's words. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint I'll share and it has, uh, it has those, uh, one of those images in it. And if you want, we can return to the discussion about the uh, corn blue room, but I uh, do have some other images and it kind of ties in nicely, of course, to Alan's work uh, <laughs> using a, a detail from his work uh, in thinking about uh, relationships. And it's interesting because the University of Toronto and Cornell University Uh, do share, I think, uh, interesting commonality to illustrate Alan's point. I think they were both the largest recipients of monies from dispossessed indigenous lands. Uh, Under the United States, it was under the Morrill Act, which which, uh, established the original uh, uh, money foundation for this university. And I think that um, University of Toronto is actually in the same space. And uh, at Cornell, Cornell is by far the largest uh, recipient of uh, monies. And so as a faculty, we're in negotiation with the administration to uh, help them to understand uh, their responsibility to this. And so there's a website at the American Indian and Indigenous uh, Program at Cornell, uh, it's if it's A I I S P. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, our response to the dispossession project, so okay. How long do I have, Nick? Like um, five uh, minutes, ten minutes, twenty. Oh, 20, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> as long as you would like to speak, though. Okay, uh, we'll see. Let's see what I could do in twenty. Okay. 
And so I split my time between Gaigono homelands and actually um, the Skarura or Tuscarora nation, which is located in the Andoaga or the Seneca territory, Western Door, Western New York. And uh, from the escarpment at Tuscarora, we can actually see Toronto at various times of the day and night. And so it's, it's interesting because uh, from that vantage, you know, we look across the lake and, you know, we can actually see this other, this other, you know, part of a very important world, you know, pre-contact and, uh, and it reminds me consistently about how, how much in dialogue our peoples around the Great Lakes have been, you know, and so I think it's a moment that we're beginning to pick that work back up again. And, uh, and so this, you know, this question of our people returning to various places. At one point in time, the Oneida had came back from uh, Wisconsin and reclaimed space in New York State. And I'm living through this moment where the Gaikono or the Cayuga are also coming back and claiming, reclaiming their homelands. But what's interesting is that in part, they're not being met with a welcome reception in parts of the regions around the around Cayuga Lake, one of the Finger Lakes, and uh, there are some ports of welcome, but there are also uh, many coded messages that they don't want to see another uh, Haudenosaunee community reestablished, even though we have this long claim uh, to these territories. And so I've been thinking about this a lot because uh, I think part of my responsibility as a faculty within their homeland is to support their return. And so, but within the context of your exhibit, which I wish I could come up and see, um, I've also been thinking about this trajectory and the Confederacy uh, I've always been thinking about how sovereignty is expressed within our communities, what instigates it, when we uh, appropriated this concept, how it was uh, instrumentalized in our communities. And uh, coming up, uh, there's going to be, I think, a lot of talk and discussion around the role that a title holder named Descahe played. And it was because he was sent by the um, the council at Six Nations uh, to Geneva in 1924 to assert our notion of nation. Uh, it's a much deeper history that people are working through right now, and I'm really grateful to the work they're doing. But I look at this, I think about um, the relationship of one photograph, the really kind of um, thin photographic record we have from this moment, yet how important this photograph has been for us to imagine what that trip and journey was all about. I link that to the text, Basic Call to Consciousness, which was actually um, co-authored by John Mohawk, one of my uh, professors at the University of Buffalo, which has reached a milestone after 50 years of education at the University of uh, that focused on American Indian, Native American, and now Indigenous studies. It'll be the first uh, university uh, in the SUNY system in New York State to actually uh, become a department. And so I give that credit to the thought leaders that were there for 50 years, but also I think to the heavy lifting by uh, Dr. Teresa McCarthy. Uh, but uh, the uh, basic call to consciousness and also then the, uh, the text of Voice of Indigenous Peoples, I think these books are seminal text in our thinking about ourselves as nation within a broader global context and how important that's been uh, for the Haudenosaunee. And for a long period of time, I feel that there was kind of a resistance to the notion of sovereignty. And 
there for me is definitely a divide between the way in which sovereignty is expressed in many academic writings and how it's actually enacted within our communities. And within our communities, I think it's absolutely continuously related to land and place and assertion of this land and place. So I think this might be the photograph, Mick, that you were referring to. Um, and it's, a, it's a, again, another important image uh, that's part of our, you know, today we might think of it in terms of our imaginary of sovereignty, but it's actually very much part of our practical assertion of sovereignty. And, and yet, I think we need to reach a point where we can begin to discuss the complexities of what this image represents. So certainly, you know, there's been a shift in the way that we present ourselves publicly at this period of time. There was absolutely an appropriation of a more generic or Western style of dress that was more legible to uh, both the American and Canadian publics of what an uh, Indian was. And my grandfather, uh, who is in the center here, uh, right, right in front of the Union Jack, is um, often was quoted around this point that you know he's aware of our traditional clothing and the gestoa, but this is what the public needs to understand as uh, indigenous space. And so I think that you know, there's a kind of strategy in their public presence that we can't really uh, we can't really ignore. And so they began this march uh, as a way to uh, remind the settler states that uh, we have the right to move freely in our homeland. And so when the march happens from uh, the Canadian side to the U.S. side, it's called the celebration. And when it and then when it goes from the U.S. side to the Canadian side, it's a commemoration because the Canadian government has yet to accept its um, uh, responsibility to the Jay Treaty, and it's actually within the Jay Treaty that that right for free movement in our homelands is articulated, and. And so, I, you know, my work and my thinking is deeply impacted by coming from a family that put its bodies on the line for our continued ex ex uh, existence as, you know, Haudenosaunee people. And in my lifetime, we've had continual pressure to be dispossessed. And it did happen at Tuscarora and it happened to the Mohawks, it happened to the Senecas. And so we're not in a post-colonial stage, we're in a continuously empire building colonial stage. And so then how, what kind of thinking do we need in order to secure our place in the world? Because it's essentially about our ability to be with each other as peoples, and to have a secure place to enact um, these relationships. And so, you know, this is consistently been at, I think the center of my work and what I've been thinking about. And so one of the, um, and this is my beaten up old red card. And, but I think it was an important and assertive document that the Haudenosaunee put together that reminds us about all of the treaties that define our relationship to the state. And then in the center, of course, is an embossed uh, visualization of the circle of 50 chiefs of the great law with the tree of peace in the center. And um, it's, uh, it's uh, I think about uh, the way that, you know, we have to had to operate in the world. And so ours, I think, is a more, uh, as Haudenosaunee people, I think ours is a, uh, has always been the need to have a strategy and to understand how it's been uh, embodied. And to, and we've always understood the significance of the physical material symbolic gesture. 
And so uh, the wampum belts, which are eloquent abstractions of deep political thought, uh, are important for, I think, all peoples, all indigenous peoples in North America. And I think one of the important works that artists and um, people that are working in expressive culture at the interface between publics uh, perform is that by bringing forward uh, these, um, these uh, historical uh, symbols, as well as, you know, contemporary political assertions, it continues to remind people that these are active for us, that they're not something in the past, but that there's something that are part of our political, physical, um, intellectual, uh, and material vocabulary today. And and so this shot was taken, I took the shot at the, um, the Great Law. The Great Law has been traveling through our territories, I think for the past eight, maybe 10 years. Uh, it was traveling every year for eight years, I think, and then it had to break off because of the virus. But uh, they always bring the belts out and remind us that we're responsible to understand the um, the uh, what our what these what the our responsibility to these uh, these ideas are that are invested in these political uh, and also um, epistemological statements, right? And so. When I put these two photographs together, I'm actually looking at two different systems, right? But they both are really communicating uh, parallel ideas about the structure of governance that I think the Haudenosaunee had to assert because of the longevity of our con of contact, that this became one of the ways, one of our strategies for maintaining place. And, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, you know, since the, you know, 1600s, we've had to uh, create and understand how to maintain and hold ground. And I see th these uh, things as like critical parts of it. And, and what I'm also witnessing is, the ongoing enactment, and I'm careful not to say reenactment because I think these are active political assertions today. There's no nostalgia involved in these marches. Uh, they're meant to this, the, the instigation of the march at Canandaigua, uh, it takes place every year on November 11th and every year, a runner is sent to Washington, D.C. to ask Hanit de Gaius, right? Village Bernard the title. The, actually, the way the Cayuga named uh, the president of the United States precisely because of the scorched earth campaign that uh, Alan referred to. Uh, so the president of the United States is what we refer to as Hanit de Gaius. Uh, and we send a runner there and we invite the, that title holder to treat or meet with us at Canandaigua, which hasn't happened yet. But we're going to be here and we're going to still keep making uh, that run and, and bringing that wampum in to remind them of their responsibilities. And so uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, bringing out the belts and uh, having title holders and faith keepers, uh, looking at our relationships between these states, uh, again, is another way that I see the Haudenosaunee as uh, reminding our own people, reminding allied communities, reminding uh, citizens of settler states that this is our place in the world and that uh, you're not guests, Right, because that has never really been uh, expressed. You know, you're you're in our territories, you're in our ancestral lands, 
and we've yet to really clarify, uh, I think, or update how we need to understand that relationship today in a more proactive and productive way. And so there's a lot of assumptions involved in our co-sharing this space. And so I think that um, we do need to reconcile the violence that took place uh, at early contact and in many ways continues to take place in order for a profound healing to take place in North America and actually throughout all of the Americas before we can move forward. And I think it's a profound understanding that needs to come, uh, that needs to be imagined, you know, because that's the role that artists play, is that the artists are the people that imagine and help other people to imagine these possibilities. And so I see uh, all of these things is working in concert to uh, move in these directions. And so the uh, enactment of the two, of the rekindling of the two row relationship between the Haudenosaunee and the um, uh, state of uh, the Netherlands is, doc uh, uh, this took place in New York City in 2015, but now we need to follow up and we need to find out what the Netherlands have done about it. How is our relationship better? Uh, how have they recognized uh, or, or uh, what, are, what are the gestures now beyond the handshake in front of the media at uh, the receipt of the canoes that came down the Hudson and meeting in New York City at, at this moment in time? And so these are some of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, but one of the things that I'm actually thinking about for sure, because I look carefully at photographs, I use photographs in my own work. And I think about each, I think about each century as having a relationship to particular technologies that can't be ignored, that are integral to the way that we understand our time and place. And so, you know, in the 1800s, the invention of the camera shifted the way that we understood how it is we framed our world, right? And so now we don't use even that term camera anymore. It's too limiting. We talk and we speak in terms of lens-based practices, you know? And so the, 20, the 20th century was actually very visually centric. And now in the 21st century, we've moved into, we've shifted from the analog to digital. And in that movement towards the digital, we're actually reimagining space in ways that is actually much closer to our, uh, the epistemological structures of indigenous knowledge. Because within all our structures of knowledge, uh, we uh, actually excel at uh, consistently recognizing that nothing is static, things are in constant motion and transformation. And so it's interesting how technology now is beginning to also function in this way. And in particular, when you think about like the interface or interaction in virtual space. Now I'm not suggesting or celebrating this. I'm just pointing out that there's um, attachment now to this technology as a way of thinking. So the question is, can we harness that thinking to actually then transform the way that people think about uh, our responsibilities between ourselves and other living beings? Can we, can we catalyze this thinking to transform the way that we think about um, our relationship to, to each other as human beings, different, different, uh, different peoples coming from very different worldviews or coming from very different uh, philosophical underpinnings. Uh, how can we begin to see this transformative space as a way to, uh, to do this work? But for sure, what I'm looking at here is a distinct difference between the way in which women work and the way that men work. 
And so up until this point, all of the images that I've shown you, which are of course are very Haudenosaunee centric, feature just men at the front of the line walking the border. And what we see here in this image from 2013, of course, is women uh, as leaders. And it's not just from one nation, but it's indigenous women from across Turtle Island came together to assert change. And so in the missing and murdered indigenous women's movement in, in the formation of a group like rematriation, we could see women working across borders in ways that historically uh, the men in our communities did not. And so I think there's a teaching in this that we need to listen to that even within our own people amongst the Confederacy, uh, amongst the Haudenosaunee, I think we need to rethink the, um, an attitude of coloniality, perhaps an acceptance of a patriarchal structure that uh, doesn't really, um, uh, that, that needs to recognize uh, uh, knowledge holders or needs to recognize uh, uh, people for their value and not for just their gender. And so, so I guess my own little contribution um, for lately for the Cuga was uh, anchored in this exhibit where I created a road sign and then projected signs from all across the Confederacy. There's over 60 different images that tile through this projection. Uh, and then I anchored it in the uh, Johnson Museum on Cornell University's campus. And it's really interesting how the museum has transformed because at this period of time in 2012, there was actually a very nervous discussion about uh, the um, assertion of putting a road sign on Cornell's campus declaring it was Cayuga territory because my, my initial proposal was to actually put the road sign on the campus outside as you would mark territory, just like there are green signs all over uh, the region that are historical markers that mark the Clinton Sullivan campaign. So this was my response to it. And I wasn't, um, it wasn't approved to actually put the sign on the outside of the museum because they thought that it would have been a little too aggressive and suggest something that perhaps wasn't uh, legally true, right? Because, you know, it's a little too sensitive right now about the Cuga and reclaiming territory. And so I compromised and put it in the museum because I still wanted to have the conversation because when I came to Cornell within the Ithaca region, in this region, I would argue that the Cayuga and their presence was relatively invisible and that we've worked very hard to uh, make their presence known here in this region. And so two years ago, I was one of the inaugural um, uh, participants in a class that we began on the Cayuga language the first time in 160 years that the Cayuga language was ever taught in its home territory. And, uh, and within one year, we've had, we have the entire region and campus recognizing that the Cayuga is the way that uh, they're referred to in, their, in the written record and amongst settlers, but that the way in which they refer to themselves is the Gaikono. And so that's a small accomplishment, but I think we have to take it you know, that we, we have to work in these small, very, uh, we have to take every step we can, we have to, we have to, uh, we just have to do the work and sometimes the gain seems small, but to actually make uh, any indigenous peoples in North America more visible, to recognize the way in which we refer, refer to ourselves in our language, is about creating a space 
and perhaps right now we could argue it's a conceptual space, but I think we need to imagine these spaces in order to actually reclaim space and continue to hold ground. And so I think that's 20 minutes and I appreciate, you know, those of you that uh, are, li are listening. And so I'll leave it there. All right, miigwech, Jolene. Yeah. I think this is a really, you touched on a couple of things, themes that have really come forward really strongly throughout Susan's and Alan's talks. I'm going, to step in, I'm going to step away just to turn the light back on it when I all right, on a sure. Hold on. I'll be right back. All right. Maybe in the meantime. I could hear you. Okay, sure. Yeah, no. I was just going to draw a line between what you were talking about, the speakers who came before you, and then I was going to introduce uh, our final, our next and final speakers to colonize this place. But I'm interested in how you're talking about not only signage on the land and these signs that uh, may or may not present a, a legal problem or at least an unsettling situation for <clears throat> for the settler nation that's been built over top of indigenous land but also being in the streets these Haudenosaunee men these Haudenosaunee women being in the streets and making a practice of marching whether across the border across the border bridge there as you showed us that that historical photo of uh, your grandfather and the other chiefs crossing the border but also those the women on Parliament Hill there in Ottawa at the Idle No More March, dancing, singing, and marching and being in public space. I think uh, Susan uh, started us off thinking about walking, just the uh, practice of walking and being in public space and being an object of suspicion, that being in these spaces that have always been Indigenous in a strong and collective way. <clears throat> um, I want to introduce our speakers to colonize this place, and I'd like to um, think about how we can these practices of being in public spaces in ways that can actually that can start to chip away at those at those cobblestones right of the museum of the city of the university right and i find that uh, there's a nice connection here to do with signage with language and with banners so i was wondering if you guys could speak a little bit about the banner that became the title the initial the initial provocation piece for this panel and also just something that Jolene has spoke of, uh, brought up, how these banners and how these visual presences in these public spaces, even if it's just in this kind of an intervention in the public conception of land and space, how that constitutes an intervention, right? So I'm going to try to share my screen again, if I can, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. Here's this. Yeah, thank you so much, Mick, for, this, for that introduction, and thank you for uh, having us here. Uh, I'm Natasha. I'm part of Decolonize This Place. This is I'm Amy. Amy. And that's Amin and Mars, and they're sitting right next to us just for the orientation of space for people. So we're on uh, two, different, uh, two different laptops. Um, yeah, uh, so thank you so much for having us here. Uh, do you have the picture of the banner, the one the, the under the museum, under the city, the, the land? It's in the back. I think there is one uh, I think it'd be good to just kind of have that picture of the banner as like, yeah, that's, you know, under the museum, under the university, under the city, the land. Because I think, you know, like, I think it's a, it's good to start from the question that you started make, which is like, you know, what do you, it's also under the beach, under the cobblestone, the stone, then what do you do with that? And how does that organizing and movement seep into the university, the city and the museum? And I think that, you know, just through the process of doing the work with Decolonize This Place, we've been organizing around the American Museum of Natural History, the Brooklyn Museum, the Whitney Museum, um, the, you know, uh, MoMA, uh, Guggenheim. These are, you know, so we've kind of been organizing around, you know, institutions like American Museum of Natural History, which you can look at them and be like, oh, they are straight up colonial because of, you know, what they hold to something like, you know, MoMA or Whitney, which is more modern, right? Or like something more contemporary to be like, oh, how is this colonial, right? And then you see the board of directors of all these museums. It has people like the Safari Land, you know, which is Warren Canders, who has tear gas, you know, everywhere in the world. So then you have, you know, Leon Black, who is a sexual harasser to like Larry Fink, who is like, you know, uh, the Black Rock guy, right, which is, you know, related to the, you can talk a little bit about that. So then you kind of start seeing the, the interlocking directorate that exists on the museums, you know, the contemporary museums, and you can start seeing 
that on the other side of it is interconnected struggles because then it centers Palestine because a lot of the defense technology that is happening in the world is Israeli technology, right? And through Palestine, then we can see how surveillance works in our cities. And, uh, you know, I can see like how I relate to Kashmir or let's say, for example, movements of land grab that exists in places like India where the farmers resisted, you know, for privatization of land. And so like, I think at this point, you know, we have to kind of, uh, you know, especially when Jeff Koons sculptures are going to the moon, I think the kind of resistance against uh, settler mentality is extremely global and also very much local in our own sites. At this point, nation state, every nation state has almost become a settler colonial nation state within their own structure. And so then I think the museums and the land and the city and then borders, I would also add, are, are re like, you know, really important points uh, for us to, uh, to, to kind of consider. And then, so this banner that you see actually was made while we were organizing at the Whitney. And I think it also came from that place because we realized that when you organize around these art institutions or the university, the, the mechanism of counterinsurgency and co-option is active all the time. So what happens is your struggle then gets mediated into diversity, equity, and inclusion projects. Right. And so that when we started seeing that, then the kind of whole organizing that we did at the Whitney Museum in 2019 was like, let's start from crisis and then move to decolonization. Because the crisis of war in Candace was just like an event in the kind of narrative of settler colonization. Right. And I think that this, you know, like as we know, that uh, settler colonization is a structure, not an event. And you can see it clearly at the Whitney Museum. And so then what we said that we will do nine weeks of art and organizing, each week we will go at the Whitney. And at each week we will go with different struggle. We will talk about you know, land, we'll talk about Palestine, we'll talk about sexuality, we will talk about a teaching about Sudan because that's what was happening at that time. And so we'll create space you know, in that kind of, uh, in that enactment of resistance. And so this banner was then made during that time because it was also against co-optation of our movements by these institutions like the museum uh, and the university. And so I think like, you know, already said on this call what, you know, Jolene and Alan were talking about that the university is also a land grab project. And so is the museum. And uh, so is the city. I mean, we've organized at Central Park, you know, public parks were also like a mechanism of land grab. Theodore, the, actually the, the statue of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, he was one of the main people who advocated for the public parks. So he was actually like, that's the settler kind of thing that they wanted to save his statue because he was a conservationist, right? And whereas we were like, it all must go. Uh, and, you know, we, we were kind of thinking about structures of de-assimilation then, like, how do you not assimilate? And so I think then, you know, uh, I think the question that you pose around, like, how do you pick up the stone and both be in the museum city? And, you know, it's just that you have to inhabit all the spaces possible at this point. And we have to think about it from an abolitionist space, from a decolonial space, from a planetary space, and then think about organizing what it means for us to then think about forming these decolonial kind of relations that have care and healing as part of them. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that just kind of, again, at being anchored and <clears throat> being anchored in the banner and thinking about how we came up with the phraseology and why, I think that thinking and doing from where we are becomes critical to the work and critical for how we form alliances. How do we think strategically? What are sites of struggle? How do we connect them to each other? Because of a few recognitions. And I think that they're related to sovereignty, but also it's a, it's a moment. Some of the things that we think about is that, you know, we're not, we are not for the national project. We're not for the nation state. We know that this concept has been quite young, that it comes from a European civilization, that it's rooted in Westphalian civilization, that people who have gained their freedom during the decolonial decolonization struggles of the 60s were assimilated into an international world order that's against them. And then the people that we're left with don't represent us and can't represent us even though they look like us. And we're inheriting a colonial condition that can't be simply rooted by organizing around identity. And that we have been pushed and forced into spaces and into areas in which we're all kind of trying to survive 
but survival itself isn't resistance. It needs to be oriented. And this is the political project. So then it's like, how do you build coalition and power of both resistance, but not comporting to the thing that you're resisting against as you build and learn how to defend and you recognize the debts that are owed to each other where you are and you don't buy into the binaries that are forced. So then the starting point is a reorientation toward each other and what we need. And in the banner is a recognition, not only of positionalities that we inhabit, but relations that we need to find accountability and responsibility for. And it begins with the land, not as a metaphor. And it begins knowing that we don't, you know, that part of the work is then figuring out the relations that are, have happened over time. And we know that we're in a moment in which even the idea of land back is complicated by the colonial reality we're living in. So we also don't want to make it a metaphorical thing either, the call itself. So this idea of a banner works a little different in the sense that it's made in community, that it's a reflection of movement thinking that is rooted in other movements that have passed that are not European because the situation is, is also connected to a broader movement that tends to be reduced, erased, relegated, but that is rooted in African thinking and tradition as well. So in the midst of all of this, this banner then becomes something that by the virtue of you standing in front of a place, you point to it as a target. You point to it as a place of gathering. You point to it as a strategic engagement. You, you kind of make it available of like, oh, and if you understand what this is, it's connected to that. And oh, somehow your feet are on the ground. So what do you do? What kind of questions are you asking? Who are you talking to? Right? Now the banner also has other roles that we can talk about in, in kind of the streets and how they function as a, as a tactic in the media yeah. strategy. Yeah. Um, maybe I could add just <clears throat> something that happened uh, during the weeks of action uh, at Strike MoMA, where <clears throat> there was a space that was taken up by us for 10 weeks of art in action that was across from MoMA. And this was a, a plaza that was a privately owned public space in New York City. There's a ton of these, they're known as POPs, right? But there is really, right, no public space, but and then at the same time, public space is, right, <laughs> it's the occupied land. So, um, so like in this plaza, <clears throat> the use of these banners were a way for us to like think of a post MoMA future. One of the banners, banners we created was the Strike MoMA banner. The other one was also thinking about what does post MoMA futures look like as we come together that's not mediated by the museum because we're not in it, right? We're creating another space outside where people come together of different struggles, talk, having conversations. There was a library, there's, there was food, um, there was art making and quilt making, and, <clears throat> and it was just uh, poetry and dance, right? All of these things were um, happening in the space while at the same time, there were little acts of counterinsurgency, right? That was trying to keep us from actually gathering in this space. Like one example is that they took away the trash cans so that they could control a narrative of like us as like unruly protesters or activists, right? Um, another thing that happened over time is that they started building out scaffolding to cut off the amount of space that we can use, right? And it just continues to build out until they just had the whole plaza completely blocked off, which pushed us actually closer to the museum, right? And then at the same time, with these banners in these spaces, it was clear what we were there for. It held a political framework for us to gather and have the conversations that were needed. And they were also pointed at MoMA, so the people inside knew what we were about to, we had like, right, MoMA workers come out and join us when they were off shift or when they could, um, right? These banners also used in action were a way to like, for us to move in formation, to move together. And this, it gave a feeling of strength when we 
were holding these banners through the streets. Um, and it, it created the imagery that was used in media that couldn't like uh, put their own spin to it because of the banners providing the political framework of what we were doing. Um, those are just, oh, and, and they're also very tactical in the sense that like they could be used as ways to protect people in the streets, right? To cut off pathways of cops. You know, um, and also not only that, like they provided a feel, right? Which was important, like a feel for the spaces that we were moving through um, because they're beautiful. They're just beautiful too. <laughs> I think a lot, you're making me think of when uh, Isaac Dillard talks about the, when they went to, not Isaac Dillard, Isaac Murdoch. <laughs> um ottoman collective went and uh <clears throat> and made those banners of thunderbird woman and ojibwe man and they when he was talking about the placards he says this is like a transformational image it makes people 10 feet tall yes yeah, so i love what you're you're talking about these banners are about a like i don't know they help people be together right and they help the that um, um do you want to show the next picture and then, why did she go somewhere? Uh, oh, yeah. Mars, wanna, do you want to continue? You can talk about what you were going to talk about. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know. If, can you hear me, Mick? Yeah, this one or the next one? This, the next one is uh, the AMH action. Yeah, we could do this one. Let's stay and here. This one? Okay, this, let's stay here. Um, I think that what I just want to talk briefly about is uh, this idea of intervening in these spaces. Um, and using them as platforms to train in the practice of freedom, why one does that and how serious one is about, you know, um, you know, uh, abolition or decolonization. Oh, okay. Um, uh, abolition or decolonization or anti-imperialism or anti-capitalism. And, and what does it look like to, um, you know, as Fred Moten said um, in a talk that we had, um, uh, around Strike MoMA last year, um, not to necessarily take over these institutions for our own, um, but to but to exit, right? And what does that look like? Um, and so I just want to root it in my own experience. Um, you know, for 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 me, and some, that something that Fred said in that moment that really resonated was, you know comparing the museum or the university to a plantation. And he was saying that the, my ancestors didn't want to take over the plantation, um, not because there isn't amazing, you know, you know, not because there's not things that one can do with the space, but because the plantation itself was a huge part of the ecological uh, um, um, damage and harm that was done to the land, right? So it's not that we're, we're, we're thinking through these institutions in a way um, where they're a symptom of the problem. And if, and, you know, if only they had more black artists that look like me, if only they had, you know, um, from again, just speaking from what, what I can speak to, which is, you know, growing up in, in the Southern United States, um, my grandfather being born into slavery in the 1800s, um, you know, being a first generation, um, you know, you know, you know, college kid trying to figure out what the hell it means to be a college professor right now, um, or a PhD student, and all these different things. Um, I'm not so much interested in in the takeover, and I have no allegiance to the institution. So there's an exit, I think, that 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 Fred Moten um, and Stefano Harney and folks during that conversation were discussing that I'm interested in thinking through um, as well. And I think that in, in Strike MoMA for us was kind of, um, well, what we said is like Whitney, the Whitney Museum actions were kind of like the coming out, <laughs> the coming out party for us of like, by the way, 
the mu under the you know under the city or under the museum under the university under the city of the land like this is what we're about you thought that we were just about these x y and z but here it is and then strike moma was really the exit plan right it was this idea of like how do we talk about the institution without centering it how do we both refuse and affirm um, and then the last thing I'll say, the reason why I wanted Nick to stay on this image is um, during studio visits earlier, um, one of the students asked us what our inspiration was, which took me a little bit to kind of think through it, but I always kind of uh, returned to this idea around um, ancestors, um, both, um, you know, my ancestors, future ancestors, and um, I don't, you know, the world that I want to bring into existence for, for my children, the same way that my ancestors and my grandfather and my great grandmother did that for me. When I look at this image, you know, I'm in thinking of the American Museum of Natural History or Museums of Natural History in general and the atrocities that they've committed against peoples around the world. Um, I, I just think that, you know, and then in growing up in the South, you know, where we had Confederate, you know, I lived off of Jefferson Davis Highway, right? Which is like the, the president of the, of the Confederacy. Uh, anyways, and uh, Confederate monument on every block type of shit, right? Museums, they, out of the question, no way my eye was gonna be caught in a museum. I have an MFA, no way I was gonna be caught in a museum as a kid, just because of the violence that I know they committed against our communities. So when I look at this image, it just reminds me of, um, you know, the work that we do such that, you know, we, you know, this says remove the statue, but we were also saying respect the ancestors. And I think that, you know, Strike MoMA, Whitney and all the work that we're doing, the exit, the coming out, all of it is in that vein. Amazing. Yeah. Um, we have time. We have uh, time for uh, final comments. If any of the members of the collective would like to, to say anything, and then I think we'll wrap up. Let me watch everyone. Okay. Well, um, I think that, uh, you know, some of the things for, you know, us to think about as we move is like, you know, there's something that we think we have, a, we're also trying to come together after a long time and start thinking about next steps. You know, I think this exit uh, that, you know, Mars is talking about, I think that's an important exit, which is not necessarily, I think this is, this is the question too. I think if we can think about under the city, under the museum, under the land, I think we've been talking about the under commons, but I think that under commons already exist in different places. We know that, you know, as people who have been dispossessed or people who have been colonized or people who have been kind of been under the Western empire in some ways, but also like, let's say nationalism or like, hierarchies that have existed in different parts of the world. Like, for example, I come from India and, you know, you, you have like caste hierarchy over there, right? But there's also indigenous struggle. There's also a struggle against war. So like, how can we actually think about, you know, decolonial, anti-colonial, uh, abolitionist, and anti-imperial struggles all together? And I think it's really important, especially because of just, you know, like I mentioned earlier, um, settler colonization is a global project at this point uh, and also like you know with, with uh, I mean already with moon and Mars and so like when we are talking about any of these things you know which is this project of de-assimilation a project of like abolishing you know private property and our like for example changing uh, you know our relationship to lands or like thinking about borders or like what does our solidarity then mean as you know let's say maybe western citizens versus somewhere else so like you know these are all questions that I think then become really important questions uh, but also I think another point uh, to talk about is desire. Maybe you want to talk about that or should I? Maybe you go and I'll just add a little. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But also like, you know, talking about desire, I think that's where I think is really important because it helps us move away from this binary of within the institution, not in the institution, you know, struggling with the state, not the state, where, where do we kind of think about? It? And I think the desire based structure, you know, is really important because as people who've been organizing, especially in the movement world, and then also like as just people who come from like, you know, histories of colonization, 
A lot of times our organizing also comes from trauma-driven or pain-driven models, which the institutions actually put on you for status quo, which is also a form of counterinsurgency. That's when you have you know, NGOs handing you a ticket saying that you are an underprivileged child and you need education, right? Or like uh, a community program at, at a museum, for example, with high school kids. Like, you know, like what are, how are you actually like, you know, thinking about that positionality, I think is really important because most often we've been taught to think from pain-driven models. Even as an artist, let's say, who's making subject matter, let's say around Palestine, for example, or war, everything is, you know, like the media around war right now, like, or even like, for example, the media around what was happening at the Whitney Biennial on the border, everything was like, you know, against consent of people, the, the mechanism of war, you know, the media imagery that comes from war, that, I mean, I think you asked the question also in terms of visual form. It's also visual res resistance because you're, you're resisting against those kind of images, right? So when we're organizing at the Whitney Biennial, one visual is actually migrants being returned from Tijuana border, for example. Right. And so it's really like, you know, the shifting of, you know, like, for example, the banners or even our pedagogy, the pamphlets that we give out in the museums um, to like how we you know talk about actions or to think about what are these spaces of imagination that we can create because there is a war on our imagination. Right. And so then how then we can think about projects that are visionary organizing as Grace Lee Box used to say versus reactionary. How do we think about like what time is it on the clock of the world? And right now, you know, much of reality doesn't really make sense. <laughs> We're living very algorithmic lives post COVID. Everything is based on, you know, like Zoom, apps, all of these things. Our social relations have changed. You showed the society of the spectacle in the beginning. If we kind of go back to that move as well, like it's, it's a very different reality that we're living in. So I think in that reality, centering land, water, air, as you know, as, as places of resistance and like as places of resistance against privatization of them globally is really, uh, you know, because we can see that what's happening with even most of the resistance that's happening here in North America against drilling, against, uh, you know, fracking, against industry, against the project of development and colonization. And I think even within our museums and universities, it's really important that we talk more about the, these projects of development and progress and really move even, you know, our curatorial approaches or like, you know, art historian approaches or even as an organizing approach outside of nation states, thinking more about degrowth, like not thinking about growing at all, like just stopping. Um, <laughs> we just need to stop uh, in all ways possible and organize and take care, you know? Um, yeah. Because I think when we're saying the exit, we're also talking about the refusal and we're talking about sabotage and we're talking about theft from the institution to the people, right? From a recognition of like, honestly, decolonization and abolition right now are terms that, you know, we many people are assisting in their co-optation into academia and into museums through a language of, you know, um, politics of identity around inclusion. But I don't understand how anyone can can be okay, like cannot recognize the contradiction of being hired, you know, to teach around freedom when you're putting students in debt. What is it about that? Or that there's a tenured professor versus an adjunct, and an adjunct versus a student, and a student versus the staff. And why isn't, and, and people are gonna teach about politics and liberation? I mean, this is the real talk right now, because this is what we're talking about. Like, in a way, what, what this, this should be more of a conversation for us, because we inhabit these spaces that we're talking about, so they're tangible. And I think what we're trying to do with the work is we're trying to map out sites of both refusal and power. We're trying to actually break binaries. We're trying to, to, to kind of introduce this idea of like everyone should be revolting aesthetically, visually, not writing about it. And, and if people are writing about it, they have to be engaged in struggle and embedded in it. Because translations to others, even in the most radical sense, isn't really the political project of the moment. The political project of the moment is how do competing political imaginaries that find themselves being killed at various intensities learn 
to rearrange desire towards a future political project that is being created in the now, in the, in, in the little cracks, in the nooks, in the crannies, in the things that are not recognized, that we can't recognize, that we need to learn how to recognize, that we need each other to recognize. And if that's in an academia, then everyone should figure out how it can also coexist elsewhere. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, we're failing at what we're doing, but we're figuring it out as we do it. And the spaces like this, this isn't about the monument. This is about people coming together that otherwise are in isolation. Because maybe when they come together, the knowledge is that they generate in the transformative moment that gets created and the media making that's happening is all part of a conversation. We just don't need to ask for grants to create it. That's, that's the thing is like pretty kind of like it's gotten to that point. It would be weird if us and institutions don't pick up with the, with the temperature in the streets. And it would be a sad missed opportunity because the infrastructure is needed. And when we go after these institutions, we're going after them because we're responsible because we're a part of them, whether we like it or not. So then in focusing on these institutions, we're trying to put also out signals in the world around knowledges in which we can come together and actually both resist and build. Because when is it gonna happen? It's already happening. Who goes to MoMA? Very few people go to MoMA. Who listens to this conversation? <laughs> Very few people listen to this conversation. Yet the modes of, of, of sharing knowledge is still one-to-one. -one. That's where it's happening in most of the world. So then, then we ask, why do our universities not have spaces and why do professors not say anything about that? Because in the 60s, going back to the 60s, there were physical spaces and when students gathered, they organized. And when Colombia was occupied by students, it was because they were organizing by, by the communities that were outside of its walls. And then the city modifies its architecture to keep those gatherings from happening. And we find ways to pick up the barricades and make them into our own, <laughs> turn them to our own uses. Um, I want to, um, I think I, we need to, to finish off here. I want to offer a few finishing thoughts. I'm going to stop the share here. I'm going to unpin you guys. Unpin, unpin. I want to just draw on a couple of threads that uh, you guys ended on this idea of we are, we are working together in spaces. We don't have perfect ways of being together yet, but it's a practice that we are continually developing ways to be together. I just also want to pick up on a thread that Jolene put down, which is that this is not a commemoration when we are marching, when we are remembering these histories. It's not a, it's not like a, a, a what was your word? The, um, it's not a reenactment, it's an enactment. And I do want to kind of bring us back to the, uh, what we were talking about initially with under, what's under the cobblestones, the beach, right? What's under the university, what's under the, um, what's under the city, the land. So when we pick up those cobblestones, I want to avoid the kind of implication that we are kind of trying to excavate a past or return to this nostalgic state. And I want to think instead about how we can pick up these pieces, not to excavate that nostalgic past, right, but to build something else, another way of being together, whilst remembering where we came from and remembering that this is, we are part of an ongoing practice, an ongoing um, lived practice of resistance, all right? Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, I do want to invite Gareth uh, Long to let us to close us out here. Just with a few words. Thank you, Gareth. Great. Thank you, Mick. Um, yeah, I just wanted really quickly. Uh, that was um, fantastic to sit through. I mean, it's funny. I, I lived in New York for quite a long time, and this is exactly the kind of roundtable that I wish I had been part of when I lived there. Um, there are so many things that talk about both New York State, and New York City. Um, so it was like really kind of made me like a weird kind of nostalgia for a place that I don't like not a time or a place that I actually want to return to, but to return to it with this kind of thinking, uh, this kind of activity. Um, so thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you both uh, to Susan and Alan, Jolene, but also to Natasha, Amy, uh, I mean, and, and uh, to Mars. Um, so um, I, I want to thank, thank also Maria and, and Jason, Maria and Jason Leon for 
uh, programming this, this roundtable and the MVS Pro Seminar Series. This is our final one of the year and what a way to, uh, to end things. Um, I really, yeah, it's, it's, I thank you so much for, for the programming throughout the term. And this is, yeah, this has been such an amazing way to end it. Um, and I think uh, it was mentioned today that um, some of, uh, some of the, the Decolonize This Place members did some studio visits with the um, Masters of Visual Studies students. Uh, hopefully that was, was fruitful for everyone. Uh, and it's, it's, it's really amazing that, that you were generous enough with your time, um, for both this evening and, and earlier today. Uh, and it's great because um, hopefully people are aware that the Masters of Visual Studies um, exhibition is coming up on May 11th. Um, so hopefully things that you filtered to the students will, will actually like, will, will see, will manifest uh, in this exhibition. Uh, and Maria has also been really helpful with, with that as well too. Um, so that's May 11th. Um, so I just wanted to, 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 to mention that, but to really to thank everyone. Um, it's, been, it's been really uh, great to have you here. So, so thank you as part of Visual Studies. I just really want to say thank you for, for all of you to, for taking the time out and, and being so generous. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'll just do a final plug for the Nations by Artists exhibition, which closes this Saturday. And uh, we'll then we'll yield over the space to the MVS students. But uh, I also want to thank those who are uh, the viewers with us, both here on the web webinar and on uh, YouTube. And I encourage you to join these conversations and be part of this, this, uh, this collective building of something else from the cobblestones of our of our cities, our museums, our universities. Okay. Miigwech. Thanks everyone. Frank, are we off the, the stream now or are we still alive?